Hello and welcome to another edition of Turn Out a Punk. I'm your host, Damian Abraham. Once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had their life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, huge guest from Uncle Tupelo, from Wilco, from Golden Smog, from a variety of other bands and projects over the years, Jeff Tweedy is here. That's right. And it is a good one. More on that in one second. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turned out of punk podcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother and show producer and guest booker extraordinaire, Tristan Abraham. And he will get the message to me. Tristan also runs a turned out of punk Instagram page at turned out of punk. And, uh, I guess we don't really do anything else, but we have those two. So check those ones out. If you want to find me on social media, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at left for Damien. If you'd like to support this show, please tell all your friends about it. Let them know that we do this podcast last week. There was only one, but normally twice a week. And, uh, and, and, and it's fun. Uh, you can also support the show by heading over to turnedoutapunk.com, especially if you're in the United States, which we're tr- still trying to figure out international shipping and uh, the like, and check out some of the shirts that have been put out for Turned Out a Punk, designed by myself, and, well, my dad did the logo years ago, but you can find those shirts over there, and thank you to everyone that has already gone over there and picked one up, it is very much appreciated. You can also support the show by heading over to patreon.com slash Turned Out a Punk, and checking some of the stuff that goes up on that place. There's video versions of some of the episodes of the podcast. There's lost episodes. There's footnotes with Chris O'Toole. There's there's lots of fun stuff. And thank you to everyone that does check that thing out. It has uh, helped keep this podcast alive and, and going, and it is very much appreciated. And speaking about appreciation, I got to pass on my appreciation to the fine folks at Vans who came aboard a few years ago, said, Damien, we like this podcast do this podcast. Just don't do it out of your own pocket and help me cover the cost of this thing. And for that, I am very grateful to them. And yeah, a huge, huge thank you for their support over the years. All right. Oh, I guess I should also mention, I play in a band. We're called Fucked Up. Uh, You can find out more information at fuckedup.cc. We've got a bunch of records. Uh, David Comes to Life uh, is being reissued by Matador Records for the 10th anniversary. You can find out more information on their site. Get Better, the great Get Better Records, is finally putting out Epics and Minutes on vinyl. You can find out more information about getting that on their site. And uh, and also uh, Tank Crimes Records, Scotty Karate, is putting out Year of the Horse, our hour and a half long song on vinyl. And go over to tankcrimes.com and check out more info on that release. All right. I think uh, that is it for Fucked Up. Oh, yeah, we're going on tour. All that sort of stuff. So, you know, once in, check out fuckedup.cc. All right, on to today's show. Today on the show, the legend Jeff Tweedy is here. Obviously, incredibly well known for being in Wilco and also for being in the legendary Uncle Tupelo and also for being a member of Golden Smog and, and you know, being a writer and just being, you know, one of the great sort of musical presence of, you know, the last few decades in, in rock and roll. But to me, Jeff Tweedy's always been a punk rocker because growing up myself and Sandy Miranda from fucked up, we used to be on this radio show called mods and rockers. And anyone that grew up in Toronto in the nineties is very, that was into punk rock. I mean, is very familiar with this show and JC, the host of this show was one of the biggest, and it is one of the biggest uncle Tupelo fans I've ever met. And for him, he was always very clear to us that this was punk rock and this came out of punk rock. So I've always thought of Jeff Tweedy as being a punk rocker. And over the years, you know, reading various interviews with him, there's an incredible one in Big Takeover from I think the early 2000s, maybe the mid 2000s, where he, he talks about punk rock in that interview and, you know, various other places I've seen him talk about it over the years. I knew he'd be a dream to have on this show. So shout out to Tristan and, and Brian Schwartz uh, for making this kind of happen and getting him here because, oh, I'm excited to talk to, well, I'm excited for you to hear this thing. Uh, also, I got to give a huge shout out to, uh, you know, St. Louis is somewhere that I've always been obsessed with the punk rock from because there's not a, a overabundance of it for how big of a city it is. So the stuff that does come out there, I've, I've really, you know, wanted to always do deep dives on. So shout out to all my, you know, St. Louis buddies, Rob, Cardiac Arrest, 
Mark Hurst, Diaz, like all, all my friends from there that kind of put me up on a lot of the St. Louis stuff and, and kind of gave me some of the lore. So I knew this stuff going in. Also, huge shout out to the stlpunkarchive.omeka.net, which is an unbelievable resource for St. Louis punk from the very beginning especially through the 80s and into the 90s. That's where I hear the Culture Shock demo that we talk about in this episode. That's where I've, I've seen a lot of great flyers over the years. So check out this website if you haven't, because it, it's it's unbelievable how deep this thing goes. As for Wilco News, Wilco is uh, just wrapped up a tour. Jeff's going to be doing a reissue of the Chelsea Walls soundtrack for the, the soundtrack for the Ethan Hawke film. Uh, it's going to be reissued with some unreleased tracks on January 14th. Of this next year, Wilco's working on new stuff. Jeff, just working on tons of new stuff as well. Uh, keep your eyes and ears peeled. They're legends. Like I'm probably one of the most important American bands of, you know, certainly the last few decades. So it's a real thrill for me to ramble on and prevent you from listening to this episode. So I'm going to shut up now, sit back, relax, and enjoy Jeff Tweedy on Turned Out a Punk. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, as I was just telling you off air, I was schooled under uh, a legendary kind of radio personality here named JC, Jeff Cohen, who owns the Horseshoe mm-hmm. Tavern. And right. so I always thought of you as a punk rocker and Uncle Tupelo as a punk <laughs> band. Like that was drilled into my head from day one. So, Well, we thought of ourselves as adjacent or something (laughs) or but but definitely you know uh probably we thought of ourselves as leaning in that direction more than maybe the the way it ended up being portrayed in the public you know i'm i'm a huge fan of the records and i can definitely hear that vibe and we're going to get there but i got to start this off the way they all start off which is jeff how did you get into punk do you remember the first time you ever came across the genre well um when I was probably nine years old, I, I believe it was 76 or so. And there's the Queen's Jubilee was the same year as our bicentennial. Mm-hmm. And I think that's when punk started exploding in, in England. I very distinctly remember there being a nightly news telecast that had a feature about punk rock and I remember sitting on the couch with my parents watching it and they're like seeing safety pins through their cheeks and you know pushing each other while they're dancing and pogoing and things like that and my mother and my father being uh like oh my god this is the end of civilization, <laughs> you know, being very, very scared of, uh, I mean, that was, it was a, it, that's what the, the piece was designed to do. It was, to, it was like basically the same as like killer bees are coming. No, it, it was definitely a, uh, uh, it, it had a, uh, an amazing energy because it was almost like purpose built to, to alienate parents, you know, like it was yeah. like a, a, a perfect marketing plan built into it. No, and it was, and it worked on me in in the exact opposite way that it worked on my parents. You know, it was just kind of, just kind of like, wow, that's exciting, <laughs> you know. Um, and I was already really, really into music. I was like, you know, uh, that's all I really like to do. Even as a little kid, is listen to records and. And I inherited my older sister and my aunt and my brother's records, which were, you know, really pretty good 45 collection of Motown and and Bob Dylan and cool stuff. And and I think that my brother even had uh, gone to college and come back with like crazy. He had a crazy, sophisticated rock a record collection in like the early 70s you know like early you know aphrodite's child and amandul and and like these weird sort of esoteric records i can't really figure out where he came across them because it never really made it clear but he he ended up giving me that that crate of records that he had accumulated at college you know i was much younger than my siblings so 
Um, so I had all these kind of weird, you know, I had tangerine dream and craft work and stuff like that kind of floating around in my head. And, um, and so I would go to the store with my mom and read cream magazine. And so a lot of punk rock, the punk rock that we're getting to talk about or getting toward getting to, mm -hmm. uh, I read about before I heard it, it definitely and I saw that news piece before I heard it. Yeah, it felt like that was the case with a lot of, you know, like obviously now we take information for granted and the free access mm -hmm. to it so much for mm -hmm. granted. But at the time, a lot of it was left to the imagination. Like a lot of people were, you know, a lot of these records were put out by people who hadn't actually heard punk rock. They had just read about it and seen it and were trying to figure out what it would sound like and then putting out a record before they even got the stuff right. that was coming over, coming out of that time. Um, mm -hmm. Were you aware of like bands like Max Load and stuff that was happening in in yeah. Bellevue, Illinois? They're, they're, that band's incredible. That single is unbelievable. It's been reissued now. I think as an LP even. Bell Belleville Belleville Belleville. Sorry, yeah, that's yeah, no it. problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, those guys were around. Uh, so I started high school in like like nineteen eighty. So they had been around, and I wasn't really aware of them in seventy seven or seventy eight when they started, mm -hmm. but they were pretty legendary by the time that I got to high school and found other p people that were into punk rock and stuff like that. And they were really accessible, you know, because they, they were always around. Um, Terry Jones, uh, in that band ate the same meal every day at the same McDonald's and, and, um, he hung out at the record store that I hung out at. Yeah, you know, so I knew him a lot. I like knew him early on, and you know, he's a he's a kind of a scary dude. Ultimately, you know, he's not like not a particularly good citizen. <laughs> I would say mm -hmm. um, one of the guys, uh, Tony Mayer, in that band ended up being the older brother of one of my best friends uh, in high school, um, and he he had like this crazy. He lived with his parents, you know, and he was in his. 20s i guess at the time the max load really wasn't happening anymore and he lived in this room that was a mattress and guitar detritus and and records like all over the floor there was any room to walk i'd never seen anything like that in my life and he was also an extremely accomplished artist and 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 really into the uh, makeup art of like horror films and stuff like that. So there were decapitated corpses and <laughs> stuff in his room. It was a really, really pretty gnarly scene. Uh, and then his other brother had this massive collection of Nazi memorabilia. I remember oh, it was wow. like really a pretty scary house to go visit. <laughs> well, that, <clears throat> that brings up actually two things you kind of hear about uh, a lot in the early sort of, I guess, St. Louis across the way uh, punk scene early on is that there were a lot of like, very scary people and mm -hmm. there was a lot of sketchy politics and sketchy bands around at that time too right the most the most prominent of them being white pride which which was a joke you know yeah. I, I think they they did not consider themselves anything other than um you know i think shock merchants or something you know they they were the main guy in that band was Jewish and the uh, guitar player Bob Leach was uh, half Chinese I believe and um, he was our guitar tech and Uncle Tupelo whoa I had no idea That's yeah so wild yeah, yeah. Um, he sold me a lot of guitars he was a guitar kind of trader yeah and yeah. so I knew all of the guys in White Pride I was actually asked to play bass in White Pride for some um reunion thing that they've been offered for some alabama clan rally or oh something like that God. and they were just gonna go take the money and i was like no fucking way you guys <laughs> yeah. are insane but they were all they they were all um you know one of the guys owns a, diff, a vintage shop in Chica in uh, in st louis now yeah uh i don't think that their politics were i would i don't agree with it what they did yeah. uh even as a, even as satire, even as a joke, I think it was t taken, you know, uh, too seriously for them to not have tried to blow the whistle on it themselves or something. It feels like that's a lot. A lot of the problem with the punk rock stuff is that it's it's so much of his flirting with things that carry real weight. 
and you know and it's a lot of it's played with and and not necessarily successfully and not necessarily for the better of society well yeah it did a lot of damage and it was like um and it was uh it came from a pretty privileged point of view which i think like i think a lot of people at that time they were they were older than me too but i think that they felt like uh, it was clear the message that was being, who they were making fun of was clear to them because they assumed that those battles had all been won. Yeah. You know, they, I think they assumed that anybody in their right mind or in their right sense of, uh, you know, morality would, would, uh, so it was, I think they really thought they were punching down mm -hmm. and, um, but of course the that that uh you know that's not the way it worked out and that's not how it landed you know no. i saw white pride several times um and it was always scary it was always really scary they would end up opening for like circle jerks and different bands that came through st louis and jody foster's army and stuff like that so i saw them quite a few times and until I got to know them, I was always really scared of them, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they, it seems like they might've attracted an audience that didn't necessarily always get it, you know? And I certainly later on, like it's been taken up by an audience that wasn't in on the, you know, joke right. as they saw it. Right. I think they were, you know, I think that they were making fun of, you know, I don't know. I think the drummer. The crazy thing is that they, they lived in a, um, they lived in an abandoned or an old rug factory. Okay. They called the rug barn. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, Mike Doskasil was the drummer who ended on, ended up like drunks with guns and. And he was asked to be in Fugazi, right? Like I've always heard that he was asked to be. He was a great, great really. drummer. He had a, you know, he was like one of the best drummers in St. Louis for sure. Mm -hmm. And there was an older guy, Jim, I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. He was kind of the main guy. And he looked a little bit like Manson. He looked like a hippie. He didn't fit in with the hardcore uh, scene really at all. Mm -hmm. But he was the lead singer. And um, I remember we got invited. I don't know how I got invited over to their place one night. And I, I just went because I was just like, just thought... This is the, I don't know, I was underage and probably thought there would be alcohol there or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and Jim from White Pride walks out playing a banjo, playing Rambling Man by the Almond Brothers. Oh my God. He's like walking around in this, like just there's, it's wall to wall shag carpeting, ceiling, floor, walls, everything. It was just basically they took all of the remnant carpets and made a little studio and a, and a living room area out of it and stuff. And I just remember thinking, wow, this is, I, it was really liberating to me, actually, because he was so good at it. He was like, he, he was like, oh, these guys are fucking great. They were like great musicians. And um, I liked being around that, but I definitely was like teetering on the edge of my my comfort zone to do to be around a lot of the other stuff you know yeah well i guess going back to more pleasant subjects you mentioned that record store and i've heard you talk about it before and that it had like a ridiculously good punk section for the town you're in yeah there was um you know there was just a just a fluke i mean i think that there are these little johnny apple seeds in a lot of smaller communities like mm -hmm. belleville you know mm -hmm. and this guy's ha happened to the story I always heard was that he had cashed out a like crazy, uh, uh, crazy comic book collection, uh, and and parlayed it into a, a little record shop. Okay, you know, like he was a in our in our town he would have been considered a rich guy, you know, uh, but I'm sure he wasn't that wealthy. But his parents, I think, owned some ice cream stores. Okay. Uh, like some tasty freeze or something like that, and apparently he, being a, like having more disposable income than your average kid, had bought a lot of really great comics and first editions and things like that. And somehow the story goes that he basically sold his whole collection for a million dollars or something like something crazy even in that time period. Yeah. And so he 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 had all of these. His ordering was. Um, 
that he didn't really want to sell records that people wanted. <laughs> you know, it would, it would just be like the classic people would come in like, oh, this is a record store. Hey, do you have the uh, the new Journey? And it's like, no, get the fuck out of here. You know, like that, that kind of that kind of mentality. You know, um, but I could ride my bike over there, and um, you know, like. 10, 11, 12 years old, that's where I started hanging out all the time. And and uh, just, clo- just close enough to my house that my parents weren't really concerned about me being there. And it was next to a pet grooming place and and uh, and, to a, and next to the Schwinn bicycle store. So, um, you know, it's like, hey, have you checked this out? And, you know, like, he, he was a scary dude to be around too, to be honest, for a little kid. It was yeah. like somebody you probably... I, my parents should have been more uh, <laughs> concerned. That, that's something that comes up on the show a lot. You know, it's the idea that like punk is this weird place where it's kind of this, you know, nightmarish Peter Pan world where you have adults, especially at that time when like access to information was so limited and you could have, you had adults mixing with children, you know, and that's something that kind of mm-hmm. goes the whole way through, you know, it's always this weird mm-hmm. scene where age is is not really a thing but then you're also like yeah but these are kids hanging out with like really sketchy adults in some cases yeah yeah it was like well it was like the first wave of of uh punk rock was like so um embraced by such misfits and you know there was so much decadence associated with it um uh and uh that's the side of it that I was, I mean, I was always really, I mean, I still think that the best thing that, that punk rock did and a lot of rock music in general has able, enabled people to uh, feel, um, you know, like they belong somewhere and like there's an embracing of the misfit and, and like, you know, I, I, somebody out there understands me. There's like that feeling of being seen that I think was really... <clears throat> important for a lot of people including myself but the older like the max load generation those guys were good you know maybe 10 years older than i was 20 15 years older than i was um they were already they were coming at punk rock from out of the drug culture that was already kind of established from 60s rock and roll or something i don't know there was just a lot there was an element of it that i still think uh is not the part of it that i ever really um felt connected to well it's funny because like it it is there's that there is that generation gap right where that you're that first generation also still wanted to be rock stars in a lot of cases Mm -hmm. where i think the next generation is is a lot more content with like no this is going to be just our thing where we can be Mm -hmm. ourselves and be together Mm-hmm. Um, and that's yeah, there's what, that's a lot what of carries sus- on. Sorry. No, no, yeah. There's a lot of suspicion. There was um, a healthy suspicion of the mainstream kind of grew out mm-hmm. of it. Like I think, yeah. like when you thought, watch the Velvet Underground documentary recently, they didn't think of themselves as a subculture. They were the culture, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, they all want to be stars, right? Like that, and that's the yeah. that that's something that I think really changes, and that's that's where it starts getting really interesting too. Is like where you have a bunch of people that are just there doing their own thing. Like the fact that uncle Tupelo starting kind of the same time that drunks with guns is getting going and, you know, <laughs> and Ultraman's getting going, you know, and like right. three incredible bands that have huge yeah. influences, obviously varying scales, but mm-hmm. uh, are all kind of like coming out of that same sort of scene. Like were you yeah, I, know all all... I know obviously drunks with guns, but I know all those guys and I know Rob, uh, uh, from, uh, Ultraman, he works at the record store I used to work at, uh, Euclid Records. Yeah. He's, you know, and, um, you know, we were never like super like tight at the time, but, you know, we, we have a, uh, um, when I see him now when I'm in St. Louis and we've done in stores there and I've seen Rob and, you know, he, I, I don't know, there's like a, I don't know, there's like a brotherhood there or something just from being from that that time period and remembering seeing each other around a lot is like, it's somehow, somehow a bond forms over time with um, all of those guys that were in those bands. And I know their names and I know I've seen them and stuff like that. And now, now we communicate, <laughs> you know, back then, back then, I think uncle Tupelo felt very much on the periphery of things. We weren't really St. Louis kids and we weren't really, 
you know, a part of the the day to day milieu <laughs> of you know of because there were there were like there were hang there were hangs there there was like new values uh, um, punk shop selling Doc Martens and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. We had no idea where people got those things, you know. Like I remember, we like like read about it in like Jet Lag magazine or something, and I'm like, oh, go check it out, and it's like, holy shit, these jackets cost four hundred dollars or something. You know? Yeah, it was like well, I don't know if they weren't that much at the time, but it was just like, oh, all these kids we're seeing at these shows are wearing these clothes, and I had no idea where to get that stuff. I mean, I knew that those things came from England, and I saw them in NME, and I saw them in Melody, you know, like all the different magazines and stuff that I would get my hands on. But um, I didn't think there was any place in the Midwest you could get that stuff. And I think a lot of those kids hung out there, and they did shows in the basement there, and and we weren't really we weren't really invited into that scene too much. There's also like a socioeconomic thing you bring up there too, because like Doc Martens weren't cheap, you know, like these are no. expensive boots, like all this sort of stuff was like, it, it, it costs money, you know, and I think that's mm-hmm. uh, eventually in hardcore, it starts, you know, reflecting more open sort of fat. There was less of a fashion code as, as things kind of carry on. Right. Well, I mean, there's a suburban element that we weren't really, uh, I don't think we, people have described Belleville as a suburb of, of St. Louis, but it really didn't, it felt much more isolated than that. It was like much more of a, a factory town, you know, like uh, there was a brewery and stove factories and an army boot factory and stuff like that. So it had its own little like, you know, working class economy that I feel much more connected to than um, the suburban malaise that gets described as a as a launching pad for a lot of punk rock and stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Well, I think it's it, it, that's another place that punk comes from, right? Like, it's industrial places too, right? And like that's where you know I think the the fashion less fashiony side definitely comes from more industrial kind of roots. Yeah, I think like I think of like the Minutemen as being maybe mm-hmm. sort of more along like Pedro being an odd odd coastal version of something like what we experienced you know so like what was your first show that you went to uh first punk rock show yeah or, or just in general first first concert you went to um the first show i went to was to see the stray cats <laughs> Oh, when awesome. they only had an an English album out, it was only available. The first record, you know, they moved from the Long Island or wherever to England, and they Dave Edmonds produced their first record, I believe. Yeah, I think and, so. And it's uh, it was only available as an import, and I would have only ever heard of it because of that record store in Belleville, you know. Mm-hmm. And I we went to see him at this tiny little place in St. Louis. My brother took us because we were underage. And uh, all I remember is they had their guitars in trash cans because they're <laughs> like stray cats. You know? <laughs> well, and, and Brian Setzer was in like I think this band, the Bloodless Pharaohs, who I still haven't yeah. heard. But yeah. um, um, I'm like obsessed with the idea that like yeah, he had this like even pre that punk life, mm-hmm. like he was at the very beginning of everything. Yeah, 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 and the, and like and uh, for us there was no, you know, we didn't have it wasn't codified in any way for us to understand what would be acceptable to to like or not like you know um uh it's funny because you should tell somebody that now and and they remember the mtv version of the stray cats but for for us it was just like oh yeah they're just they're a punk rock band that looks like this yeah (laughs) you know like especially when it first happens like it's such an amazing period because like motorhead's a punk band and the stray cats are a punk band and the specials and like everyone's kind of like and then as you're saying like it eventually gets codified and marketed down and whittled down so it's like Mm -hmm. yeah now when you say the stray cats there's a lot of uh 90s swing baggage that (laughs) (laughs) yeah oh it was fucking cool and i saw him again like about um, I saw him in Spain in 2019. We were on the same festival as the Stray Cats, and we had a day off, and I got to go see him and stand on the side of the stage. And it was it was really weirdly life affirming because they were so good at exactly the same thing, and so committed to it. But it wasn't just them. There was this um, this beautiful community of people that like were. Uh, 
it's like they were dressed up like you know there was a subculture there yeah. was a subculture of people wearing their their animal print like uh dresses and 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 uh had their hair slicked back and it was just like i don't know it was just so sweet it was just so fucking sweet and and was, you know that they're like kind of sitting around and they live in this subculture and there's like this is a big event this is like you know being visited by the pope. Uh, yeah the pope <laughs> yeah exactly it's it's like it's amazing how certain types of music hit geographically in such a way like spain loves mm -hmm. garage rock loves rockabilly mm -hmm. like it just like it just met spanish culture and really agreed with the punk rock there and mm -hmm. you know like it's amazing yeah like there's huge festivals where it's just like these bands like all the meters and all the all these bands from all over the place coming over there and converging and it's it is kind of beautiful like japan too there's like whole subcultures of this in japan still right as yeah well uh, where did you kind of what was your first punk rock show like first like more punk. like local-ish kind of punk rock show um well punk rock punk rock came to belleville pretty early i'm just i'm not i didn't get to go to these shows but it's it's a weird i think kind of subtext mm -hmm. so there was like i remember shows that i didn't get to go to <laughs> pretty pretty strongly like like black flag played at mr a's discotheque in belleville that's um, awesome before I was able to really go see shows. So that would be early on on the first sort of runs of, of them, right? Yeah. Like dead yeah. singing probably. Yeah. And, oh, uh, awesome. um, you know, Joan Jett played pretty early on. There was this place in, called uh, Stonehenge in Lebanon, Illinois. The Ramones played there. Uh, early on, I, I heard stories about people that worked there throwing tomatoes at them, and you know, just like it was, it was just kind of legendary stuff that would get spread around the lore. I, I honestly, I'm having trouble remembering what the very first like punk rock show would have been for me. It was probably Black Flag or Minutemen or, or you know. Uh, Circle Jerks, M J Jody Foster's Army, which it's all mixed together. I can't remember which one of those was the first, you know. Uh, Saccharine Trust, we saw like stuff like that a lot. Who would have been some of the early other bands that were playing, like Screaming Mimi's and stuff? Like who would have been like these bands that would have been opening up earlier on for these shows? Ultraman yes. opened for a bunch of bands. Yeah. You know, St. Louis also had the habit of um, – you know, like at Mississippi Nights in St. Louis, that would be a bigger punk punk show. That would be, you know, above the basement of of uh, New Values clothing shop. Okay. Um, so the like legit punk bands that would come through, the promoters would always put their pet project bands. Like uh, there's a band called Fool's Face that would open up for bands and get mercilessly booed because they were they were new wave you know it was already like it was already you know it was already getting divided up enough for people to go no well, this is wrong you're like these guys had rat tails and synthesizers and stuff like that um a band uh culture shock yeah yeah uh darren gray who ended up playing with with me later in yeah. life but i've known darren's been one of my best friends since i was like 18 years old or so or like maybe even a little bit earlier than that and i helped produce that culture shock uh i ended up being like just a tape i think because they, they toured a lot though because i think i've seen stuff like flyers of them from tons of different places over the years there might be another culture shock. I don't know. It's possible. Uh, they were like a weird synth band, uh, yeah. like a synth punk band. You know, like um, it wasn't. It sounded like hardcore still, but but Darren played and sang with one hand on a like a prophet <laughs> keyboard. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and they opened up for Black Flag one memorable time because Black Flag didn't want to go on that late. And so they ended up playing after Black Flag at the Turner's at the Turner's Hall in St. Louis. And I remember that Darren had taken so much acid or something that all I remember is him being underneath the drum riser the entire show. <laughs> <laughs> just going just peeking his head out and going, <laughs> 
and there was nobody there, of course, after Black Flag, everyone had left. And... Yeah, that's like the, the batting cleanup after Black Flag seems like a, a nightmare, even not on acid. <laughs> no, it was it was like a fever dream. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you wind up playing in the Dazzling Kill Men a little bit too, right? Like on a couple records. I am. I might have played some little parts here and there, but I don't. I don't remember. I've never played live with them or anything. I definitely. Uh, Darren and and Nick uh, Nick Sakes is like he's always one of my best friends growing up, and and um, I don't know why those guys all thought that I was a good guy to have around in the studio. Uh, but I didn't really know how to mix or do anything like that. But I would get asked to do that a lot with, with guys like that. Um, and I think I ended up being a pretty, you know, good set of ears on the other side of the wall for them and stuff like that. But I would never really classify myself as a producer. But I think I got credit as credited as that on their single. I think two of the singles you're credited as that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we ended up, we did one at Albini's place. And I just remember being in the control room with Steve Albini and they would start a take. And then he'd turn the faders down and read a magazine. And when the when the meters stopped going, he would turn it back up and go, "How was it?" And they'd go, "Jeff, how was it?" And I'm like, "I didn't hear it." <laughs> See that? But that, that, anyone can be a producer, you know. It's yeah. Varying varying skill sets have to be employed there and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, how did the Uncle Tublo relationship come about with Rockville Records? Um, well, at the time it was giant records when yep. we first came in contact with them. Yeah. And, um, uh, I think we had made a cassette and it got, <clears throat> got written about in CMJ mm -hmm. as like pick of the week or something like that as like a demo cassette. They would like pick one out and like highlight it every issue. And so we got a handful of calls from independent labels at the time. I don't remember what any of the other ones were. Uh, we got booked to play at one of the festivals, one of the conventions, like either CMJ or New Music Seminar, something mm -hmm. like that in New York. We drove there. We played at uh, Continental Divide okay. in Manhattan. I don't even know that place. It was a tiny, tiny place. We got really, really drunk. I fell off the I fell off the stage in the first song, and and Debbie Southwood Smith from uh, Rockville was the only person that was from a label that was still there at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's a process of elimination. And she thought it was great. She really just loved it. I, I don't know why it wasn't musical. I don't think, you know. Um, uh, yeah. And so then by the time the record came out that Irving Azoff had swooped in and bought the name Giant from them. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's weird. Uh, I'm having a a great time talking to you about this stuff because I feel like it may, it's making me feel like I won't, I'm not crazy. This is, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, the names, you know, a lot of the people, and these aren't a lot of the, this isn't stuff I get asked about very often. And it's not stuff that, I mean, it, it has gone, gone unexamined for so long, probably in, in most of my conversations that revolve around music that it starts to feel like it was a something I made up or a dream or something like that. But this all checks out. It's like fucking it's it really happened. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And I think I think a lot of these people don't get the credit because she has a great ear. Like the stuff that she was signing from, you know, yourselves early on to Shonen Knife to like Tater Tots put out a record on there too. Yeah, right, right. Like she she like I, I just think there's so many people that, you know, at that point were kind of going out there and like finding these diamonds in the rough and, and kind of mm -hmm. like giving them platforms early on that, uh, I don't know, it's just, it, these people are fun to talk about for me. Yeah. I think that there was a, you know, there was an in-house rivalry at Dutch East India between Gerard <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, their, their snobbiness and, and, and Debbie who was, you know, um, she was more of a glamorous 
like a and r woman you know i think she she liked um she would have liked to have signed david bowie or something like that you know she wasn't um gerard was i don't know signed amazing stuff there was so much amazing stuff that came out on homestead and we were happy to be just adjacent to homestead <laughs> in terms of like all the the bands that were on it and stuff like that um but uh but he had definitely much a much narrower idea of what was acceptable in terms of ambition. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, he is. He to me is still. I've never met another person like him in terms of the way he appreciates music. Like he still goes to see mm -hmm. random DIY bands every single night in Austin. Right. Like that he's never going to sign, you know, just because right. he loves that kind of stuff. Like it's really, you can see why he signed what he signed. Yeah, there's like there's like a, he's a he's the fucking real deal for sure. We we had a big argument out in front of uh, CBGB's one night um, because he had said something about Uncle Tupelo being I don't know. He said something really snarky and terrible about Uncle Tupelo. I don't remember what it was, but I don't know why I was I must maybe drunk and I confronted him about it and I remember having this big debate. He was. I think he took exception with the ad copy that that Rockville had used, which we had nothing to do with. Yeah, it, which I think they said if Woody Guthrie had lived through the punk era or something, and I took exception with it too. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I was just like, "This is insane!" You're like that's that's we can never live up to that. That's insane. Stop saying shit like that. But 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 I also wanted to defend ourselves against like Gerard at the time. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I have no ill feelings towards him whatsoever. And I've, I've met him a few times and stuff ever, you know, over the years, seen him around. And yeah, he's like, he's like the, you know, he's like the drag city guys. And he's like a lot of the, like the, the long, long haul guys that do still have that, that um, uh, inexhaustible energy for, mm -hmm. you know, finding out what people are doing hearing hearing I, I mean I feel like I'm like that I'm not a label guy but I feel like I'm I have the same kind of youthful desire to not necessarily hear everything but to try <laughs> you know yeah no, I don't want to hear everything I don't know if I want to go to a show every single night I think that's yeah. the energy. going to shows has, has, has ceased to be fun for me a long long time <laughs> yeah. ago you know, I mean, yeah. not, not, not really, but I mean, but a lot of times it's, it's not a comfortable place to be. And I want you, you to know you're not alone in having issues with Gerard and stuff that he wrote back in conflict. First time or second time I met Jello by Afra, he mm -hmm. went off about a review that uh, Gerard had given him in 1984. Four, yeah. I think. <laughs> he was still oh, really I, yeah, I about it. <laughs> no, I'm on I'm on his side in the argument now. I think I, I think <laughs> I, I don't I don't have any axe to grind whatsoever. I, I think it was a silly thing to put in an ad copy, you know. Well and I think it's also very uh there's a sweet irony to the fact that, you know, someone for Matador is getting angry at someone for having over ambition in ad copy. Oh yeah. Well <laughs> I mean yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but it's 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 kind of interesting at that time period, like what was happening in music, because it's it's you know it's pre everything exploding still, like everything's just about to explode. Like, what was it like early on when you guys were touring? Because you're ultimately building a scene that people operate in, probably well still to this day. But like, what was it like when you guys were going out? Were you being put into situations where you're playing with hardcore bands or like kind of noise rock bands or like where are you kind of fitting in on those early tours? Man, it was it was wild. I don't, you know, we didn't really get grouped. Excuse me. With um, we honestly didn't re get grouped with many bands that we had a lot in common with very often. You know, I think we would have been happy to be um, grouped more often with bands like House of Large Sizes would be a good example of what we thought was a good fit, you know, we, you know, in Iowa, you know, mm -hmm. or, um, you know, Miracle you get, Legion uh, even in New Jersey or something, or what's that? Miracle Legion or some of that stuff that was happening in New Jersey. In, no, we would get with, uh, uh, Hollow Heyday okay. and, and uh, Poster Kids were sort of a little bit around the same time, maybe a little bit later. Um, but but more often than not, we'd end up being 
booked at like a fern bar in Chattanooga opening up for a guy doing Jimmy Buffett covers or something like that because there was a book we had a booking agent early on that didn't quite get it and wasn't sure you know I think that he figured out that we could play acoustically Mm. because we did stuff like that in St. Louis sometimes and we ended up making that one record that was all acoustic um, but even before then, we, we dabbled in just being able to go play in a small environment and play acoustic. And so he got in and said that we would really take off and play, go play places like that. You know, like you know, some of the mi- most miserable shows ever, you know, just standing, just, just trying to play music to people that were waiting for somebody to sing Jimmy Buffett cover, Buffett cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's even worse than uh, having to go on after Black Flag on acid. It was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. And then, you know, Uncle Uncle Tupelo was like, had those weird things happen, like being on the Michelle Shocked record and, and, you know, played Carnegie Hall, and, you know, like opening up for Michelle Shocked. And, you know, but early on, before the, you know, before the records really came out, it was around the Midwest and it would, that would, those were more, compatible bills i think a lot of times because we would set them up we would set them up with our friends in columbia missouri and and talk about who we wanted to play with or Mm. um yeah there were some other like-minded bands around and you know like champaign illinois there's a crazy band called lonely trailer you ever check out their stuff yeah they're they were like a three-piece yeah they were like a three-piece band that sounded like Captain Beefheart or something, you know, like oh. just really wild muso guys. I ran into one of the guys recently just on the street somewhere, I think in like Seattle or something. And oh, that's uh, awesome. it was so, so nice to see him. And, and they still, they're still together. They still do stuff every once in a while, but they, they just, I don't think they ever put out anything other than cons- cassettes earlier in, in the day. I mean, early uh, when we were playing with him and stuff. And I've talked about him in a few interviews and he thanked me for that. He said something like, you've done so much nice stuff for our band. I'm like, I, God, I was like, I don't know. People should know about your band, you know? Well, and it's funny. Cause like, I, I feel like if bands got to the stage where they're actually putting out vinyl, it mm-hmm. changes the way that they're kind of like preserved in history. Weirdly like tapes, people just didn't hold on to them like, like right. so much of that stuff is and it's just not a very good medium for holding on to period so like how many my people... wife oh, my wife who ran um lounge jacks in chicago yeah 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 did you play lounge jacks? no no but it's a i obviously have the lounge jacks compilation and you know yeah. it's a story, very storied venue yeah yeah she has every cassette everybody and anyone ever sent her we have a we have a an attic full of because she listen to every single cassette that anybody ever sent her wow. and she wrote down what she thought of every single cassette everybody anybody ever sent her so we have boxes and boxes and boxes of uh, demo cassettes you got to do something with that like obviously maybe not you i think you're pretty busy you got a lot of stuff on your plate but like that's like such an incredible archive because like as we we're yeah. just saying like so how many of these bands are just gone you know, yeah, forever. Yeah. And like whose whose demos are kind of lurking. No, at some point somebody should go through it and like, you know, it should be a great thing to be a part of like a book about lounge acts or something. Yeah. Like that, you know? Yeah, that's but, yeah. Am- amazing. But, too. The, but there are there are people, you know, like yourself, like my wife, I can see behind you and wherever you are, there's like a you know, there's a there's a passion for it. So it's it's so it's gonna yeah, I'm sure we've lost things, but um I have this hope that uh there's somebody hanging on to something <laughs> oh yeah no it's it's like it's it's amazing how many times like things have just turned up through mm-hmm. you know i find even doing this show like this is a a wild one like do you, have you heard of the tulsa jacks walter's vacation mm-hmm. tape so it's a mm-hmm. tape this band the jacks uh they moved up to minnesota for the summer from tulsa mm-hmm. and recorded a session with tommy stinson and bob mold playing together Oh, wow. Tommy Stinson has no <laughs> recollection. When he came on the show, he did not remember being on this tape. And Bob had very, very little recollection. But I, I talked about it on the show, and someone sent me a copy of the tape. So it was pretty amazing. Oh, wow. That's amazing. When we played with – um, we did a version of in, – in Wilco, we did a version of Color Me and Press one time, and Tommy was there. And we asked him if he wanted to play it with us, and he said, sure. 
And this is one of the most rock and roll things anyone's ever said to me in my entire life. Uh, I said, well, do you want to play bass or do you want to play guitar? You know, because uh, you play bass on the record. Yeah, yeah. And, he said, and he said, oh, which one has the longest strap? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's amazing when you think about the fact that he joined that band at 11. Like, that guy yeah, right. grew up <laughs> in punk. Yeah. Like, grew up yeah. in music. And, yeah. yeah, it's it's weird to, like, go through those experiences even as, like, a 20-year-old. But I can only imagine as someone who's, you know, just entering puberty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, 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 um, it's amazing he's, you know as well adjusted as he is <laughs> yeah no yeah. it's it is amazing like especially because I, I i'm fascinated by it now especially being a parent like you know like kids in punk rock and like kids well, that grew up in bands you know ultimately i think uh sharing the intimacy of playing music with other people and 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 the environment of most bands is really supportive i mean contrary to the way it often gets portrayed i think that bands are really nice little support groups for the most part my experience has been as like the scarier the band the sweeter the guys and and um um and it certainly seems like it was a much healthier environment for a for a, an adolescent or underage kid than Hollywood, or you know, the, yeah. like we have all these added expectations on top of it. There really wasn't, you know, you're already doing the thing that's sustaining and exciting. Uh, if you're playing in a rock band at 11 years old, you know, you're not like that's true. And he being found his mine. Life's What's that? <laughs> well, no, he found his life's calling too, right? He's still doing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, right. He was saying his mom let him drop out at 16. Or, and yeah. uh, I'm like, well, you know, that's a lot of faith for a parent to have, you know, in their yeah. child. And he's like, I don't think she had a choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We met her, too. You know, when first time we drove to Minneapolis and Uncle Tupelo, we thought, wow, I wonder if we'll meet the replacements. I wonder if the replacements will be around. And we walked in the back door of uh, the Uptown and... Bob Stinson was there <laughs> and his mom was serving him drinks at the bar. And it was just like literally the first people we saw. That's kind of the ultimate experience you hope for when you're in a band driving into a certain town. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. It was just like, well, whatever. Yeah. Whatever band. Um, whatever band's the biggest band in the town you're going to, you know? Yeah. Do you remember the first time you heard Billy Bragg? Um, I mean, we opened up for Billy Bragg at Graham Chapel and Washington University uh, when we were maybe early on, first record or something, Uncle Tupelo. Okay. So I probably had heard those records at the record store. Mm. Um, to be honest, I was never... I I didn't respond that well to to some of those records. Uh, I know lots and lots of people love them, and I I appreciate Billy for um, you know all of the stuff that he's done. And but it it wasn't something that resonated with me at the same in the same way that the specials or or. Uh, in undertones or I mean, lots of different other things that were coming out at the same time. Had you heard that Riff Raff single? Like his pre Billy Bragg solo mm. record? No, he, no. He was on Chiswick. They did this song called I Want to uh -huh. Be an Astronaut that's just raging. Oh, like, yeah. It is incredible. But Is it with the full band? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Did, cool. I guess they did like a bunch of singles too. Some of them get really rare, but um, mm -hmm. there was a, but that first single is on Chiswick and just, uh, it's up there as like one of the best sort of first wave or I guess maybe second wave punk records mm -hmm. coming out. That's of awesome. That's uh that's the other thing that's amazing about this topic and this this uh this world of music is because it happened at that period, that weird odd moment uh between the initial zeitgeist of rock music and the internet. <laughs> There's everybody, no matter how much of an aficionado they are, has little little holes, little gaps in their knowledge that just get spackled in over time, you know, because you weren't ever you weren't ever able to get your fingers on all of it at once, you yeah. know. No, exactly. And it's now it's almost too much now. 
because yeah. like you you you're, you're kind of unable to put it all together and put it all into context because it's just which is which is kind of exciting that's still like it means it's like a kind of an inexhausting uh inexhaustible universe you know yeah no i'm i'm very excited by it like i find it's that's the the, the fact that it's going to keep going like there's not an yeah. end it's not like we're going to see this come to an end well hopefully not in the early days of uh, kind of reissues, like when it was really taking off as like early 2000s, and I used to think that there were people going, um, you know, just going and making records and saying that they were like some rare un or unearthed uh, early psychedelic record or something like that. There is a fake Kill by Death comp where uh, this band Fat Day from Boston went out and recorded as a bunch of fake bands, like old punk bands, obscure oh. punk bands. Oh, wow. Just got pissed. Oh yeah, I bet. I bet. <laughs> we thought about doing that as a, you know, our DBPM, our record label, as it doing it. I mean, just as a fun kind of project. We've been working on it for years, actually. Is I can put out a DBPM sampler, but have it be all kind of like just stuff that doesn't sound like us and make up other bands for it. And... <laughs> is this is this the thing that I read that you did? You're doing like a thing where you got all these different writers to write fake reviews for bands. Yeah. That's part of the same project, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I want to start from the review. You know, just start from like, oh, what would this sound like? You know? That's awesome. Years ago, uh, fucked up when we did we did this record, and then we did a fake compilation of bands that the people in our record would have listened to. Oh wow! And like a little a little <laughs> sample like compilation thing. So I have I have a lot of support for this idea. Let me know when, oh, you, when it good. gets further on. Yeah. Um, Jeff, this has been absolutely amazing. And you know, anytime you want to come back on this thing and talk about any of this stuff, you're more than I feel than like welcome. we just scratched the surface, man. I know, I know. I, and I could punish you all day, but uh, I, I will not subject you to that. And anytime I didn't you even get back. to tell you about Rugburn, the, the, the other band that White Pride had. What, <laughs> what was Rugburn? Rugburn? Yeah. Rugburn was their lounge band. What? Where they would all wear suits, uh, tuxedos, and matching like like pastel tuxedos, and sing country songs with a different lead singer. Holy! And they would change the lyrics like to be repulsive, you know, like really kind of really awful changing of lyrics. But uh, but they were like they were a fucking tight like lounge band. You know, they're really working this like terribly tasteless Weird Al thing, like the whole way on. Like they had yeah. this thing figured out, like in all the different genres, it sounds like. Yeah, they just they were just so provincial and, and so like isolated, I think, that maybe they, they didn't have the ambition of like a, I don't know, whatever a comparable like set satirical group would have been, you know. Yeah. Like, but yeah. Uh, they could have been Weird Al. They could have. They could have been weird out. They, yeah, they could have. They could have uh, pushed it to the limit. It's a um, band for maximum rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jeff, you are definitely not banned from this podcast. And any time, my friend. <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much. Lovely talking to you. Thank you, Jeff, for coming on the show. When you heard right there, Jeff will be back for a part two at some point in the future. And he wanted me to make sure and send his love to the Horseshoe Tavern and JC. And I got to send my love to JC too, because JC exposed me to so much cool stuff and Uncle Tupelo and made me a fan of all everything back then. So thank you, JC. And uh, yeah, that was how amazing was that? Coming up later on this week on the show, we're going to keep the amazingness coming with from the other side of the world in Australia, a punk rock legend from the gods, the hard ons Ray on will be on the show. And this is the sound of two punk rock nerd obsessives coming together and celebrating their love of punk rock. Oh, I'm very excited for you to hear this. But that is it for the show this week. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives of Indigenous peoples matter. We need to protect trans kids. We need to help trans people protect themselves and stop hate and violence towards Asian people and people of different faiths because these things aren't political issues. These are just human rights issues. People have the right to live free and you know, not fear violence and not fear hate and not fear discrimination and not have to deal with it. So... You know, if there's organizations out there that are doing stuff you believe in or are involved 
in causes that you support, see if you can lend your help, you know, be it financially, if you can afford it, be it, you know, with your time, if you have that to spare, but, you know, get involved in stuff, get, get involved because it'll, it'll, uh, maybe make the world a little bit better. Who knows? Hopefully, hopefully, uh, you can also, uh, as always, uh, sign your organ donor cards because by the time they come looking at those organs, you don't need them anymore. You're just like, get this shit out of my body. Take it, take it, rip it out of my soul because I don't have a soul anymore. I'm just a dead body. Uh, and it can give someone else a gift of life. I've seen it happen firsthand. And, uh, yeah, it's amazing to see when that happens. Uh, go out there and make your own culture because anyone can do this shit. Start a band, start a podcast, start a fanzine. It'll help your mental health. It will. And maybe you don't have to share it with everyone. Maybe just share it with your close friends. But, you know, do something creative for yourself. Try meditating, too. I didn't believe in that shit. And it worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you. Who knows? And if it doesn't, well, you're, you know, you're, you're no worse off. You wasted maybe 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Think about how much time you spend worrying about stuff. And if it alleviates a little bit of that, maybe it's worth it. And believe me, this is coming from someone that didn't believe in it at all. And has come to it, you know. And uh, that's it. I guess I will see you on the next episode. Thank you for listening. Check out turnoutapunk.com.